train these minds of us and so that we're able to depend on them. And if we don't train our minds, then they won't have wisdom and we won't be able to rely on them. There'll just be attachment and suffering coming up in the mind. So the Buddha taught us and he told us to practice following these teachings. But if we don't put those into practice, then he's not able to help us. He created and planted this fruit orchard already and has many different fruit trees in it. It's uh, mangoes and uh, durians and other fruit. And so he told us to go into this orchard to pick some fruit and to eat them. But if we don't go, or well, we do go, but we don't pick a fruit and eat it, then we won't feel full. And so the Buddha said that the Tathagata just teaches, he just shows the way. But we need to do it for ourselves, we need to help ourselves. We need to get it so that we can be a refuge unto ourselves. In the beginning, these minds, they don't have the Dhamma, and so they're not a refuge for us. We just have greed, hatred, and delusion, which are driving the mind, overpowering the mind. And so the mind, it doesn't have any energy, it doesn't have knowledge, it lacks wisdom. And so in that state, it's not a refuge for us. So in the beginning, we need to create a refuge out of ourselves, which means we need to train. We need to develop the self so that it becomes better, so that it turns from a mind that is thick with defilements, that sees everything in terms of self, that takes um, these bodies and form and feelings, memory, mental formation, sense consciousness as a self, and has these kinds of wrong view. And there's just craving and clinging there, which bring up a lot of suffering. So there's this noble truth of suffering, but we don't like it. We don't like that noble truth. We just want to have happiness. But do we see how that desire for happiness can bring us suffering? Because the happiness that we find in the world, it doesn't last. It's not just happiness. There's not only happiness there. And it can be the cause, or it is the cause, for suffering to arise. So we try and seek out wealth and money in thinking that that's going to bring us a lot of happiness. That when we get these possessions and wealth and we'll be happy, when we use them, then we'll be happy. So, for example, if we think that if we have a diamond that's worth a million dollars, then that's going to make us happy, that we have things that are better than other people, and we are better than other people. But when we gain things that are very valuable, and they get lost, or destroyed, or stolen, then a lot of suffering comes up. And so we see that there's not only happiness there. When we try to find happiness from delight, or through delight, in uh, these forms, and in sounds, and tastes, odors, tactile sensations, and thoughts, and there's clinging to those things. So in the beginning, that that's what it's like for all of us. And people born into the world, they seek for gain and the praise and status and pleasure. But there's also the opposites that come as a pair of those. And so there's loss, there's loss of status, there's censure, and there's uh, pain. And if we don't have wisdom, then we suffer when we get those things. So Ajahn Chah once said 
And it's like if there's someone who doesn't really have much wealth, if they don't have much status, and they come across hard times, then they're okay, they're able to get by. But for those people who were once very wealthy, and then they lose that, they come across hard times, it's very difficult for them. But for those who have the Dhamma, they're able to put up a good fight and they can regain their wealth. So we need to take, we need to get it so that ourselves, that we're a refuge to ourselves, which means that we're setting our hearts on creating goodness, on developing these minds of ours, so that they can turn into a refuge, so that they have the Dhamma. We're developing ourselves from putojanas, ones thick with defilements, to kalyanachanas, and those who have beautiful minds. And the mind becomes better, becomes cooler and cooler, because it has the Dhamma. It has generosity, it has virtue. So we see that those people who spend a lot of time working, they often don't have very much time for practice. They've run out of time. And so they do many things in their work, and they expand their work, they develop that. But in the end, they just don't have any time for the practice. And when they become aware of their situation, they're 70 years already, and they forget, and they're aware again, 75 or 80 years, and they really don't have much time left at that point. And even though they've gained everything, but they've wasted their time. And so there's a wise person who once said that you know, we earn a lot of money, and then we use that to buy a diamond, for instance. And so by getting that wealth, we've needed to use up these bodies of ours. And these bodies deteriorate quickly. At the age of 60, we need to put them into retirement. And even Ajahn Chah once said that uh, when I get to the age of 60, then I'll retire ready. He said this very quietly. And so we need to develop these minds from the state of a putojana to a kalyana chana. We develop generosity, and we develop this giving. We give in many ways, give to the katina ceremonies of monasteries. When we do that, then we can feel a great sense of joy and happiness in the heart. Right from the time that we think about that, even think about how we're going to make the katina offering next year, and already the heart feels up with happiness. And then we recollect all the times that we've offered these katina of robes. There's a sense of ease in the heart. But we should think about it in, in a way that doesn't bring about worry, but rather that brings about this inner joy, this joy that comes from developing goodness and skillfulness and merit. So a Kalyanachana is a being who has a beautiful heart, and they're very difficult to find in this world. Those who are generous, those who are virtuous, and even more so those who meditate as well. Those who chant, who sit in meditation, it's very difficult to find these kinds of people. And it's even rarer to come across one who can ordain. Ordain as a nun for maybe seven days, or as a novice for perhaps a month. It's very hard to find these kinds of people. But sometimes there are people who ordain at the age of 60, and they have great faith in their hearts, a lot of energy, a lot of determination. And so they practice well, they practice strictly not missing out on any of the meditation or chanting sessions, fulfilling all their duties well. And even the younger monks can't keep up with them. So this sincerity in our hearts is something that's very important. And they see that they are old already, and they don't know when they're going to have to leave this world. And this is a really good opportunity that they have now, that they've had to wait a long time to get. And so they are sincere in their practice.
So there was one time during the Buddha's life when he was walking to the city of Varanasi and he met a Brahmin on the path. And this Brahmin had ordained um, outside of the Buddha Sasana. So not long after that, this Brahmin disrobed. And then later on in his life, he thought about the Buddha. He recollected uh, the Buddha and how the Buddha spoke kind of such lovely words. And so he um, came to study the Dhamma uh, with the Buddha and practiced, and in not a long time attained to arahantship. So it's not the case that just because someone's old, they can't attain, they can't awaken. That is possible for them. It's possible for anyone when their barami becomes full. So in this practice, we develop ourselves so that they become better, so that we become a person who has a heart with Dhamma, so that we're able to contemplate well. And if ourselves, if we're really a refuge unto ourselves, what that means is that the mind is pure, and the mind has Dhamma there, which is caring for the heart. <clears throat> so the Buddha was just the one who pointed out the way, and we're the ones who have to walk this path of sila, samadhi, and panya, of virtue, collectedness, and wisdom, having mindfulness, having this clear awareness, abiding within the heart, contemplating the body, the heart's external body, the internal body, and contemplating the Vedana outside and inside, the mind outside and inside, contemplating all Dhammas. Because the Dhamma in the Dhamma, what that means is all Dhammas. It means seeing things as anicca, dukkha, anatta, as inconstant and stressful and not self. And perhaps in the beginning we see this to one degree. Maybe we see how all the things of this world are anicca, they're all changing, they don't last, and the mind becomes bright and fills up with joy and happiness. And we see then that the Dhamma has such great value and wealth. And we see how all the things in this world, no matter how valuable people may consider them to be, we're not interested in them. And why is that? It's because they have to decay. But the Dhamma, that doesn't decay. It gives us joy, it gives us happiness in our hearts through this clear insight. And that grows in clarity until we're not interested at in wealth or possessions. But instead we set our hearts on practicing. When we reach this point, that means we've entered into the orchard of the Buddha and we're eating the fruit there. And there's a delicious taste to that fruit. It's fragrant, it's uh, sweet, and it's juicy as well. And it's not like any fruit that we've ever eaten before, that nothing has a flavor quite like this. And people who see the Dhamma, and this is what it feels like, it's the comparison that we can give. So in the beginning of the practice, we're generous, we're virtuous, and this is like us eating a fruit that is uh, juicy. And then we develop a little bit of samadhi, and it's like that fruit has a bit of sweetness to it. And we carry on practicing until we see the Dhamma, and that's when the fruit becomes fragrant. And it has these three qualities of of you know, juiciness and sweetness and fragrance. So when we practice, then we see that this world, that we don't want to seek the things of the world out anymore, because we perceive how they're meaningless, how they're unsubstantial, how everything changes, it all arises, stays for a bit, and then ceases. You see how I am not in the five khandhas, and the five khandhas are not in me. 
how everything is empty. And this emptiness is Buddha, is Buddha nature. And Buddha nature is there within everything. If we see in this way, we perceive how there's no being, no individual, no me, no you. There's no one who gets angry, and there's no one to be angry at. We see how these bodies, and they don't know what's going on. They don't know that there's anger. The mind itself, it doesn't know. And so who is it that's angry? Well, it's the defilements that bring this up, but the defilements themselves, they have causes and conditions to bring them into being. And this too is true for greed and delusion. So if we contemplate this, then we'll see how there's no one who's angry, and there's no one to get angry at. And when the mind comes into samadhi, kanaka samadhi, upajara samadhi, becomes still, quiet, and empty, and there's lightness and ease there within the mind. And there's the presence of these qualities of mindfulness and clear awareness. And whether we're standing, sitting, walking, lying down, listening, speaking, eating, thinking, we've got mindfulness there caring for the heart. And then the mind can really enter into samadhi as these uh, factors of uh, Vitaka, Vichara, Pitisuka, Ekakada. So the initial and sustained application of the mind is rapture, happiness, and one pointedness. And then when the mind is gathered together into one point, then we look at physicality and mentality and see how these things break apart, how they break down, and how they're empty. Then the mind passes over becoming and birth. It passes over sangsara. It goes to the other shore. This is the state of uh, gotarapu jitta and gotarapu jnana. It's like it's a vehicle that takes us over, that allows us to pass from being one with a beautiful mind to a knowable being. So there's this feeling that we're just going to pass over. And you're going to go from Lokya, the mundane, to Lokutara, passing beyond this world to the transcendent. And we go to this other shore, the shore of emptiness. And we see how form is not self. But there are still these fetters that are binding us. We still have things tying us down. And it's like there's um, a rope with 180 strands to it. And so we've cut one of those strands, and there are 179 left. But we have still seen in this way, so we know how to practice, and we do it again. Do a lot of walking meditation, sitting meditation, until the mind gathers together into one point, one pointedness with one object. It's full of energy. <clears throat> and when it comes out of the state of samadhi, then we can see the body is being empty once again, and the mind's able to pass over once again. And then it gets pulled back. And we carry on going between these two states. And this can go for six months, until sila samadhi panya really gathers together, the path comes into harmony, and knowledge arises. And we gain the wisdom that comes through bhavana, through mental cultivation. Seeing clearly, knowing the truth, knowing reality, seeing the Dhamma, until so there's just one life left. So we do this, we practice in this way, seeing the results from our practice. And then we've got the Dhamma as our refuge. But if we don't have Dhamma, then there's nothing really that we can rely upon. It's just greed, hatred, and delusion which bring about suffering in our minds. So we take the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha as our refuge. We recollect this triple gem. But it's not just enough to recollect that. We need to practice following the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, until this Buddha nature, this inner quality of awakening, the Sangha, appears within our hearts. 
And here we see the results from our practice arising clearly for us, within us. So if we firmly train ourselves, then everyone, anyone, is capable of realizing this Buddha nature, of realizing awakening. Because these minds, jitters, these knowing elements, they're not self. In the beginning we may think of them in terms of self, that this mind is self, this knowing element is self. But when we gain knowledge, then we see that it's just nature. That everyone has this knowing element, everyone has a mind. But it's not a being, an individual, a me or a you. It's just a knowing element, it's just a mind. When we understand that, then suffering simply can't arise. But in the beginning we do have a self, so we should bring that to developing goodness, to cultivating wisdom within the mind. So we take these bodies to speak and act in ways that cultivate goodness, to be abandoning evil, giving rise to goodness. We do this a lot, develop this a lot. Because we need to leave everything in this world. And so there was one of these great teachers, these great masters, uh, Wimpu Sang, who was 111 years old. And he passed away just this morning, at 6.20 in the morning. But he was one who had great virtue, who had Dhamma. And when I went to pay respects to him not too long ago, we spoke together for a whole hour. So therefore for us, we should contemplate, we should be heedful, we should set our hearts on this practice, on meditating, and so that we can see into the Dharma before these bodies break apart. We see the body break before it really breaks. We die before we actually die. All the things that we use, we need to see into that, and how these things are broken already, how they're of the nature to fall apart, and so we won't suffer when they do break. But if we use them with delusion, then we're going to suffer due to them. So we should contemplate like this in a way that gives us Dhamma. And really the Dhamma, it's just this, it's not difficult, it's not complicated in any way. But for wisdom to arise, we need samadhi first. So we need to train in that. Train in walking and sitting meditation, chanting, meditating, do this a lot, develop this a lot. To not be heedless by the fact that we're still alive or that we're young. Because our youth, it's not a sure thing. And sometimes children, 10 years old or 15 years old, they die. They haven't yet reached the age of 20. And for us, that we are able to survive to this present day, means that we've got merit, but we shouldn't be heedless. We should develop these selves, care for these selves, until we see into the true self, which is seeing that the self is not self. We see that these five khandhas, which we initially clung to as being me, are actually not me. If we see the self as actually being a self, then that's being deluded. We understand that the self is actually me, it's actually us. But when we see the Dharma with clarity, and when we see the Dharma, then we have a self which is abandoning unskillful deeds and giving rise to goodness. And we carry on doing this until we gain the understanding into not-self, seeing the self as not-self and thus transcending the world. So we need to practice until we reach this point, until we have the Dhamma as a refuge for us, so that we can close off the lower realms, and there's no eighth life left. So may you set your hearts on this. <laughs>